Is that better? But it's recording, but there's no image on it. Is there a um, cap? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but how did... <laughs> All right, hold on. There it okay. goes. Does that okay. look better? Okay. All right. <laughs> the first lecture is done. Now, uh, is it recording? Yeah, it's recording. All right. Okay, sorry for all these false starts. Now, I have some um, candy here, and anybody who asks a question gets a candy, unless we run out, in which case I'll have to go to Costco. Um, so I've got some of them. Yes, is that a question? Yeah, I have one. <laughs> oh, that's the only question of that call. Um, um, I remember the first time I started with Candy, uh, there was a student who actually just graduated, um, and uh, I said I had uh, chocolate. His first question was, what kind of chocolate? And I had to give him one. And I forget his name, but he's very uh, Christian. Cesare, uh, Caesar or something. All right. Now, um, a new book came out from Cambridge University Press, and um, professors hate to change textbooks, but I was never happy with the textbooks that I was using. Weinberg's three volumes are definitive, but very hard, and, and um, very hard on the student, and uh, really, um, but, I mean, if you want to look at them and read them, they're, they're a marvelous reference. Um, this one seems, uh, seems better. It's very broad, and um, the material is presented as simply as possible, but not more simply. Um, okay, now let's, let's see. What was I going to say? Um, so that's the website. On that website, I've got, um, I've posted a PDF of the first chapter and of the second chapter, because some of you will, will not have books immediately. Um, I only learned today that there are two printings so far of the book. I thought that since it's a 2014, the one I got, I have, it says 2014, and I assumed that there was only one printing, but there were two one in December of 2013 and one in June of 2014. The second printing has fewer errors because uh, Cambridge is a responsible publisher, unlike Wiley and Elsevier, and actually corrects typos and uh, tries to uh, do things reasonably. Anyway, on this website, uh, I have links to, to uh, Schwartz's two uh, typo websites. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the typos. I don't think there are any typos, though, in chapter one, which I'm going to try to cover today. Um, OK, I think that's basically everything. So let me um, start, unless you have questions. Um, the, the first chapter is about um, black body radiation and the, radia the interaction of radiation with atoms. And um, so let me just just uh, go through what um, what um, is in chapter one. I think it's it's, it's rather nicely presented. Um, the first thing, of course, is that the if you if you have a volume, a cube of side L, then the boundary conditions, uh, say the field is zero, a node or something at, at the uh, two ends, are uh, like this, where N is um, a triplet of integers, C is the speed of light, and uh, L is, as I said, the size of the box. Now, um, in this book, uh, C appears only once or twice because he said C to the 1. That makes um, the formulas uh, simpler, and at some point, we'll want to set also H bar to the 
one. I, uh, the summer be, well, I guess it would be last summer, I heard a marvelous lecture by a theorist who started out by saying, I'm going to set um, h bar c 2 pi and 1 and minus 1 equal to 1. And um, then he went on with his lecture that, in which he was trying to just present the concepts without getting all the numerical factors, any of the numerical factors, right? <laughs> but it was a very marvelous, it was really marvelous talk. Now this business of Siegel and h bar equal to 1, these are called natural units, which I guess Feynman um, was a fan of. Um, but they're used all pretty much universally now in particle physics. Um, and uh, there's a discussion of them in, I think, Appendix A of Schwartz's book. I'll have to put that appendix on the, on the, web, on the web page also. Um, but basically, C equal to 1 means you measure uh, distance in units of time, or time in units of distance, I guess distance in units of time. And then um, h bar equal to 1 means that you, h bar is erg seconds, and uh, or energy seconds, and it means you measure energy in, um, in terms of time also as sort of 1 over seconds. And um, uh, so what this means is that the formulas are very simple. They don't have all those h bars and c's, so there's less, less for the eyes to look at. Then you'll get a, an answer in some calculation, and then you want to put it into universal units, that is to say, by putting in the factors of C and H bar. And what you do is you imagine that C is salt and H bar is pepper, and you just sprinkle them until you get the right units. Since they're one, you can put in arbitrary numbers of them in numerator and denominator, and um, as you do that, when you multiply by C, you multiply by length over, over time. When you multiply by H bar, you multiply by energy times time. And eventually, by putting enough salt and pepper on the result, you get something that has the right units. That's basically the idea. It's, it's, it's extremely useful, though, because the formulas are simpler, and your eyes and your brain aren't distracted. And, um, but anyway. OK, what, what is the intensity? So you imagine you have some uh, cube that's uh, surrounded by metal, and then you put a, a little hole in there, and you look at the radiation coming out. And uh, this thing is called black body radiation. And the intensity, well, by definition, it's 1 over the volume times uh, the, the derivative of the energy with respect to frequency. So oh, this is a particular definition of intensity. And this just um, has to be omega squared. Well, because there are more modes, the modes grow as omega squared. And uh, because omega, of course, is the length of the unit vector, uh, not the unit vector, the vector of integers n, and that goes up as uh, omega squared. Uh, so it's, but then d omega, so, so it's omega squared, and then uh, energy, and then uh, c cubed. So this, by dimensional analysis, and or just sort of common sense, this has to be what it is from the classical point of view. But then what you get is you get that i versus omega causes a parabola. And the actual observed thing looks more like that. And uh, this, of course, was, this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And um, Planck uh, uh, produced what he thought was a toy model to get a mathematical formula that fitted this curve. And, um, and so what he did was he said, well, the, uh, the energy is uh, uh, h bar omega of a uh, frequency omega n. And we have our formula for omega. So this is um, 2 pi over L um, h bar 
n vector, and if I keep the c for a few more equations, looks like that. And then this thing is the same as uh, the length of p, because we're talking about light after all, so the mass is zero, that is to say, m squared is e squared minus p squared, and that's zero. Okay. And so what is the average energy? Well, the average energy is, of course, a sum on j. Let me, let me introduce beta as 1 over kt. So this is just a standard stat mech abbreviation. Um, k is, of course, the Boltzmann constant. So this is h bar uh, omega n times j, and we're summing over j e to the minus, now we're going to assume uh, uh, the um, Boltzmann weight for uh, a system in equilibrium, e to the minus j h bar omega n times beta, beta being 1 over kt, and then we have to divide that by what's called the partition function, which is just the sum of all of these probabilities. This n is a subscript. Okay. Well, there's a cute way of doing this, um, which is due to Dubai. First of all, the sum here, yeah. Can you run, remind me, I haven't taken a stat in a while, why you're in the numerator, you're summing over, there's a j in there, in like the expression you're summing over? Like, you know, it's j h bar omega? Right, j h bar omega and beta. And then down here, the energy is j h bar omega n. The idea here, well, the idea here is, with, is that, see, Planck's assumption was that we have a mode. The mode is specified by n, the vector of integers. Mm -hmm. But let me give you your candy. Oh. Hey. Um, so the mode is specified by n, and that mode can be excited zero times, once, twice, or j times. So the energy is j h bar omega n. Okay. And the probability is right. the exponential. Right. And then we sum. Okay. All right. You. Now, yes, you will. Now, the Q, all right. Break my neck over these damn tables. Um, The cute thing is that this thing on top, of course, is just minus d by d beta of the sum on j, e to the minus beta h bar omega n. And the sum on the, deno on the denominator, well, this is just the sum of the jth power. In other words, it's this to the jth power, and that, of course, is 1 over 1 minus e to the minus h bar omega n times beta. Okay. All right, now, the thing, uh, this derivative here, well, we've got this sum again. So this sum, this thing is minus d by d beta of the sum, and this sum is 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega n the minus 1 divided by 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega n to the minus 1. And now this derivative is 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega n to the minus 2 times h bar omega n e to the minus beta h bar omega n. That's the numerator. And then we still have this thing minus 1, that is to say this denominator. And now you can see that um, we've got two factors of 1 over this difference, one factor here, and so what we actually have is we can erase this, and then we just have 1 minus e to the minus beta h bar omega n like that. And then we multiply through 
by e to the beta h bar omega n, and that gives us uh, h bar omega e to the beta h bar omega n minus 1. And so this exponential cures the ultraviolet divergence. Um, so if you have something that's causing you a problem and you can introduce it to an exponential the denominator, that provides, you know, the miracle cure. Um, nothing better than an exponential for that purpose. All right. By the way, in the, if we were instead dealing with the Fermi-Dirac case, this, um, this uh, En would um, be simply h bar omega n e to the minus beta h bar omega n divided by the sum of the two things, or with 1 plus e to the minus beta h bar omega n and then it's multiplying through by e to the plus h bar omega and this goes away and uh, this becomes a plus sign so that's the term you direct um, Schwartz uh, doesn't uh, do the h bar of uh, the uh, term you direct case any questions? Um, of omega, this is now the energy in the cube up to frequency omega. That's what this thing meant over here. D E of omega, D omega. It's the energy in the uh, black body cavity up to frequency omega. So this is an integral from zero up to effectively omega D Q den H bar omega n over e to the beta h bar omega n minus 1. So that's just this formula here. And of course, the thing over angles is, you know, my uh, integral minus 1 to 1 d cosine theta equal d phi. So this just is 2 times 2 pi, so that's 4 pi. And then an integral up to that omega, well, omega, of course, is L, I mean N, the N that you integrate up to is L omega sub N over 2 pi. So we're integrating up to that. Um, L omega over 2 pi, N squared, h bar omega dn, so I've got this written here in sort of mixed units, but um, n squared then is the square of that, and so this of course is 4 pi, so what we're getting is that d of omega is 4 pi, I'll pull out the h bar, and then I'll switch to omega from uh, n. So that's 0 to omega. Then the n squared um, gives us uh, omega squared L squared over 2 pi squared. That's by uh, squaring this. That, that two parentheses. And um, then we have an omega there. And um, we then have a dn, which is L d omega over 2 pi, and then we have the um, the uh, Bose-Einstein factor. And if you put all that together, that is um, 4 pi h bar L cubed over 8 pi cubed into 0 to omega omega prime cubed d omega prime e to the beta 
H bar omega bar minus 1. So that's what we have there. And that tells us what dB of omega d omega is, namely H bar L cubed over 2 pi squared omega cubed over e to the beta H bar omega minus 1. Now, actually, we've, we've left out the um, two polarizations. We'll put them in in uh, a minute. In fact, right now. So there are two polarizations. We've been just considering uh, modes associated with the vector n, but with each vector n, photons can be polarized um, uh, right or left circular polarization. And so then I of omega is then 1 over L cubed, uh, or let us say if that's dE over, and then it's 2 for polarizations, dE d, d omega. And so this is h bar over pi squared omega cubed over e to the beta h bar omega minus 1. So the, and that was Planck's result back in um, 1900. Um, any questions? Um, remember, you get candy for questions. This is physics and astronomy, but whether this is the right building, I don't know. We also off camera. I'm sorry to interrupt your class. All right. Anyway, now let's go to the Einstein coefficients. So the idea was n two excited atoms. I guess ground state uh, atoms. So, all right. So, what is um, happening? Due to, due to dn two is minus a plus b i of omega n two minus B prime I of omega N one. No, plus. Okay, what's going on here? A is multiplies the number of atoms. A is the coefficient of stink of, of spontaneous emission. So this is spont. B is the coefficient of stimulated emission, stimulated by the intensity omega. And of course, proportional, all of this, so this is stimulated emission. And uh, for this to happen, it's, it's proportional to the number of excited atoms, of course. So this is dn2 in some unit of time. But on the other hand, the population of excited atoms goes up because each of the n1 atoms in the ground state can be um, can be can go up into the excited state if uh, they absorb a photon from the intensity, and so this is the coefficient of um, absorption. And um, I always hesitate when spelling that word. And um, in fact, I was signing something this summer, and um, I hesitated as I sounded out the word, and then misspelled it. Um, what was the word? I don't spell very well. <laughs> Okay, so that uh, that should be zero in equilibrium because um, the populations of uh, the relative fraction of 
site of the ground state atoms should stay the same at a given temperature where everything's in equilibrium. So we're going to set that equal to zero. Let me just do a time check here. I think I'm running fast, actually. So it will be time for philosophical questions. Not that I have much use for philosophy. All right, so in comes Albert Einstein. And uh, he says, well, let's use um, Boltzmann's result, n e to the minus beta e1, n is the total number of atoms, n2 is n e to the minus beta e2. So that, settled, that was settled physics by the time Einstein was writing that. And so now if we take this equation equal to zero and put, um, let us say, the a term on one side, what we get is this. B prime e to the minus, we need n1, so this is e to the minus beta e1 minus b n2 e to the minus beta e2, and then all that is times i of omega, and I'm leaving out a capital N, and this is equal to then a e to the minus beta e2, this is the spontaneous emission term. And so then, uh, Einstein got that i of omega had to be a e to the minus beta e2 over b prime e to the minus beta e1 minus b e to the minus beta Or, uh, in simple language, A <coughs> over B e prime E to the beta E2 minus E1 minus B. And of course, E2 minus E1 is H bar omega, so it's A B e prime E to the um, beta H bar omega minus B. Okay, but on the other hand, we know what um, pi of omega is. It's uh, with a factor of two, it's h bar over pi squared omega cubed over e to the beta h bar omega minus one. And so we can say this thing is h bar over pi squared so now we're using Planck. That was Einstein, this is Planck. Omega cubed over e to the beta h bar omega minus one. Okay, well now one sees, one learns something about these Einstein coefficients. And what Einstein said quite immediately was b prime equals b. And moreover, if you say b prime equals b, you then have uh, a formula for i of omega over here, and so you can figure out what a over b is. And in particular then, a over b is uh, this thing here, which is to say h bar omega cubed over pi squared. And now that A is the spontaneous emission thing. And that was not accessible from quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you can compute B and B prime, but in quantum mechanics before quantum field theory, you couldn't compute A. But um, Einstein figured it out. Uh, this way. Any questions? Yes. Well, um, that is for black body radiation, but yes. this derivation is for two-level system, right? Oh, well, we're thinking of the atoms 
and the oh, photons all in equilibrium at temperature T, and to have real equilibrium, you need walls that are of that temperature and everything. But that was a good question, and even if it weren't, you'd get it handy. So wait, how does that justify the two-level system? I'm sorry, say it again? How does it justify it since everything's in equilibrium in a black body? It's just oh, it's, 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 it's we needed equilibrium to be able to say that N1 was big N, E to the minus beta E1. In other words, these rules came from equilibrium, and this rule comes from equilibrium. Okay. But let me get you a candy. Okay, now um, let's now do a little bit of quantum field theory, not very much. Um, it, it, it turns out that for bosons, uh, what you've got basically is a harmonic oscillator for every mode. So for the two polarizations and each vector of integers or each momentum, you've got uh, a harmonic oscillator uh, algebra. And, um, and of course that means you've got a ground state, one, two, three, and the spacing is even because it's, uh, say, the difference between 37 photons of that frequency and 38 photons of that frequency is h bar omega, and where omega is that frequency, or angular frequency. Um, so what we do, let's see, whose is this? We just move it to there, I don't want to step on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce uh, creation and annihilation operators, or the latter operators for the harmonic oscillator. And if we multiply that out, what that says is that a, a dagger minus a dagger a equals 1, so this is 1 plus a dagger a. Or equivalently, a a dagger is equal to a dagger a sorry is equal to a a dagger minus one. So I'm going to use these two relations. Now there's a number operator. Now this thing is permission, so we should have eigenvalues, and we're going to want it to have the eigenvalues that are integers. And uh, we're going to look for those eigenstates. And so we're going to say, now Schwartz puts a hat on this. I think, I think that's unnecessary, so I'm just going to skip the hat. So we have here uh, n on the eigenstate n is n, n. And um, OK. So what do we know? Well, n on a dagger n, let's see what this is. This would be a dagger a, because that's n, times a dagger n. And now we're going to write a a dagger by this relation. So we get a dagger 1 plus a dagger a n. But this gives us n, and this gives us 1. So this is n plus 1, a dagger n. But that means then that um, n, a dagger n, is equal to n plus 1, a dagger n. And so what we say then is that a dagger n is some constant times n. And um, let's just choose the phase of that constant to be uh, 1. 
uh, the, the, the constant to be real before it. So C squared, oh, hold it, wait a minute. I've done something totally stupid here. You guys have to call me on this. I mean, if A dagger N has eigenvalue N plus 1, then it's the eigenstate corresponding to N plus 1. So C squared, then, is uh, N A, A dagger N. But on the other hand, A, A dagger is 1 plus A dagger A. So this is N 1 plus a dagger A N. But this is the N operator, so this is N plus 1. We'll assume the states are normalized, and so this is just N plus 1. So C is the square root of N plus 1. So that means then that A dagger N is square root of N plus 1. N plus 1. By the way, when I have my my left hand making a 90 degree angle and I'm reading from the, I'm looking at the notes, you can say that what comes on, you can feel safe, safe that what comes on the board, probably right. But if I have the hand, left hand down, because my left arm gets tired, and I go on for a few equations without looking at my notes, then you have to start worrying and checking for mistakes. I think that's what happened over there. All right, so, so much for uh, that relation. The next one then is to consider A dagger A on A N. What's this? Well, um, A dagger A is A A dagger minus 1. So this is a a dagger minus one times a n, and um, so this thing then is a a dagger a minus a on n. That's the n operator. So this is a times n minus one on n because a dagger a on n is n. And so, what um, have we learned here? What we've learned then is that the state A n is an eigenstate of A dagger A with eigenvalue n minus 1. That is to say, this is n minus 1 A n. So A n is some C prime n minus 1. I'm just reviewing the harmonic oscillator algebra that you learned this undergraduates or first year graduate students or you went to an Asian high school in high school. You know. um, anyway, so what is uh, C prime? Well, C prime squared then would be N A dagger A N because um, this would be uh, C prime squared n minus 1 into n minus 1, which has to be n. This then is n, so that's just n, 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 which is n. Am I skipping things too much? Remember, you ask a question, you're getting n. I love Costco, actually. I think it's one of the good American corporations. Bloomberg is another. Um, if you want financial advice, go to Bloomberg. All right, so uh, what have we learned? We've learned that A dagger N is square root of N plus 1 the state n plus 1, and a n the square root of n, the state n minus 1. So these are normalized and so forth. All right. 
Now um, we're going to um, recall Fermi's golden rule, think a little bit about quantum mechanics, and put some of this stuff together. Um, these, by the way, it's, it's too bad that we don't, um, or let us say, I don't know. The best part, I think, of a quantum mechanics class is when um, one deals with uh, what I'm about to do. That is to say, you, you assume that you know that the electromagnetic field is, involves these creation and annihilation operators, and then apart from that, uh, plane waves multiply them, and uh, then you integrate over them the various uh, momentum vectors, and you relate that to the Hamiltonian of quantum mechanics, and then you compute things like B and B prime. I think that's um, one of the nicest aspects of, nicest parts of a quantum mechanics course. And, um, um, and David, tell him that passing. Anyway. Um, It's, it's a pity that sometimes it's left out of the quantum course and considered too elementary for the quantum field theory course. And uh, so I don't know. If, if, if I finish the notes that I've prepared, uh, maybe I can sketch a little bit more than what's in chapter one before the end of the hour. In any event, Fermi's uh, golden rule is that the rate some atomic matrix element squared times an energy conserving delta function, which is then delta of EF minus EI. By the way, the delta function, of course, is really a functional, and um, it's, um, so let me just say a word about that. If we have, I mean, the way we think about it is delta of, well, no, F of X delta x minus y dx, well, this is f of y. So this is the way we use it, but what's actually going on is that delta of x minus y is a functional that maps the function f of x into the number f of y. So this is function number f of y. So I should maybe match the function f into the number f of y. Anyway, I, chapter, I think, 15 of my book on physical mathematics discusses these things. Maybe I'll put a couple of chapters on the web page, PDFs of uh, mathematics, that sort of background. It may be in an appendix, though, of uh, Schwartz. All right, let me go to the front now and then continue with this uh, business. go to the, where, you know, they're on the Panda website, physics.unm.edu or something. Uh, or just Google Physics UNM. And click appropriately, you get to a web page, a class web page, and you just click on 523 and it sends you there. Fermi's golden rule, and M is a uh, final state, the interaction Hamiltonian effectively initial state. The uh, interaction Hamiltonian effectively is an HI dagger, A dagger plus an H, so 
capital I A, where A is you know the annihilation of creation operators or these ladder operators that we've been talking about for a particular mode, particular frequency omega. Okay, let's consider the case two goes to one. And the initial state is atom two. N frequent N photons in uh, mode of frequency omega, and in particular some wave vector n, some polarization. The final state is going to be have the atom in state one, which is the de excited state, and um, an extra photon. This is for the case of um, the excited state going to the ground state, or going to state one, let us say, it doesn't have to be the ground state. And in fact, over there, when I said ground state, the uh, energy one could be just any state below the uh, energy two, um, or even above. I think the mathematics would, would be okay. But just E1 and E2 are just any two states. Um, but then omega is the frequency that takes, so H bar omega is E2 minus Okay, so this is um, that, yeah. Now, uh, what is uh, M21? M2 goes to 1 then is atom 1, n omega plus 1, and now this interaction here, which is h sub i dagger a dagger plus H sub I A and now here we have atom two comma N of omega. So this is the going from the excited state to a lower state. And uh, what goes on here? Well A would take us from N to N minus one, so this is clearly not going to contribute. This gives zero, this one gives zero, so it's this one. And so what we have is that M2 goes to one is atom two H sub I atom one times N omega minus one. Oh, damn it, I skipped in my, sorry, I, I screwed up, well, not that much. I, my eye skipped down. So this is atom one, of course, atom two, and then we're going to, um, uh, N omega plus one, A dagger, and omega, and this A is, is, we could have called it A sub omega. And so I'm gonna call this M0 dagger, this is just a matrix element of atomic variables, so P's and X's and so forth, two pi's, atom one. So these are the quantum mechanical states, and then we have N omega plus one, A dagger, and omega, and so this is just M0 dagger times square root of N omega plus one. So the, this little bit of quantum field theory that we put in has reduced this, this um, problem of the interaction with matter with light down to a quantum mechanical matrix element and given us a uh, coefficient here. Now suppose we want to do the one to two. In other words, exciting the energy level that's in a lower state. So now we have one goes to two, 
And let me, let me start it here because we're always running out of black point space. So the initial state here is atom one. So this is the lower state. N omega. Final state is atom two, but N omega minus one because this um, one fewer, one proton was absorbed. So then M sub one goes to two is atom two and omega minus one. Um, H sub I A plus H sub I dagger A dagger. Atom one and omega. So once again, this is then atom two H um, sub I atom one times and omega minus one A and omega. So in other words, the creation term here doesn't contribute because this would take n omega to n omega plus 1. This is the quantum mechanical matrix element. And it is just the complex conjugate of this one. Wait a minute, why is there no dagger? Ah, there was a dagger here. I left out that dagger. So this is the uh, Hermitian conjugate of that. If we call that m omega, m sub zero, then this is m sub zero. And that is just square root of n omega, because a on n is just n, n minus one, n minus one with n minus one is one. So, plenty of time for questions. Are there any questions? I'm reminded of the of the one liner. I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a front of the bottom. I don't know who invented that. He obviously had a way with words. Sounds like a country song. Probably have found this for alcohol. Actually, that reminds me of another joke. Um, uh, Harry Hopkins was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's, uh, one of his most able and uh, closest associates. And uh, Roosevelt, of course, was crippled and president of the United States, so he couldn't travel very much. And so Hopkins was the liaison with Winston Churchill during the Second World War and the years that led up to it. And so Hopkins, who was an alcoholic, was often talking with Churchill, who, let us say, had a fondness for alcohol. And one day, Churchill asked Hopkins, don't you think this water tastes funny? And Hopkins said, of course it tastes funny. There's no alcohol in it. <laughs> I think that's a true story, but I wasn't there. All right, so let's, um, now that we know something about the quantum mechanics, let's <coughs> revisit what Einstein did. So in particular, we want this dn2, which is minus dn1, and is zero. What is it? Well, it's the um, dn2 would be minus this thing. So it would be minus m21. m2 goes to 1 times n2, the number of atoms in that accelerated state, that uh, excited state, 
plus m1 goes to 2 squared times the number in the lower state. So this is the state, this is a higher state, this is a lower state. Notice that the way we've done things here with this formalism that mixes quantum mechanics with the quantum field theory of one mode, we're uh, doing, we're not distinguishing explicitly between spontaneous and stimulated emission. Everything is just going into the pot. Uh, and it's this uh, interaction Hamiltonian that gives us um, emission and absorption, whether spontaneous or not. And now we know what these things are. Uh, the first one is M21, so that's M0 uh, absolute value squared. times n of omega plus 1, because we square this. And then that's times n2. And then this one, we just computed, and in absolute, it's absolute value squared is m0 squared times n of omega, times n sub omega, n1. And so that's... Uh, altogether zero. So this is like the, uh, the rule minus a plus b i of omega n2 plus b prime i of omega n1. So this was Einstein's expression. This is our expression from quantum mechanics plus quantum field theory of one mode. Okay, um, let's remember though what our I of omega was. I of omega was h bar omega cubed over pi squared times, well it's really times n of omega, isn't it? Um, that is to say, let me do it over here. This is another expression for e of omega. E of omega is two for polarizations, an integral of uh, d cubed n h bar omega n sub omega. And well, maybe maybe I should just say that this is h over pi squared. This is n of omega. Or equivalently, if we just work it out again, two for polarizations, four pi for solid angles, uh, h bar, and it was all together L cubed integral zero to omega, d omega, two pi cubed, omega cubed, n of omega. And that means that I of omega, which is 1 over L cubed dE d omega, well again, it's easy to differentiate when you have an integral there. This is equal to h bar omega cubed n of omega over pi squared. Okay, so we can come back and we can rewrite um, this formula here. And uh, so let me see. I, in other words, we can identify some of these things here. This um, oh yeah, we can just substitute for n of omega. So n of omega is pi squared i of omega over h bar omega cubed. So
never enough space. So in other words, this tells us that uh, B prime is equal to B, because these two coefficients are the same. Moreover, the, the ratio A over B is the ratio of these two terms. And so that is this term divided by that term, apart from the I. And so A over B is 1 over pi squared over H bar omega cubed. And so this is H bar omega cubed over pi squared. So what we've got here is that um, by mixing quantum mechanics with one mode quantum field theory, we've been able to derive uh, an expression here that's equivalent to Einstein's, but has b prime equal to b and has a, a value for a over b, because these are simply Einstein's relations, but we haven't needed to assume thermal equilibrium. Remember Einstein over here had to put in n1 is n e to the minus beta E1, N2 is N E minus beta E2. Here we haven't needed to do that. Um, also, we've got, um, we've got a formula for A. Um, and, uh, well, it's B times this, but B is related to uh, this matrix element, which we can compute in quantum mechanics. So we can compute this aspect, uh, what quantum field theory gives us is a way of computing this without using Einstein's tricks, which relied on thermal equilibrium. Okay, we've got a little bit of time left. Let me tell you what the homework assignment is. It's not due immediately. In fact, it's, it's at the end of chapter two. And I'll start chapter two on third Wednesday. But the problems are 2.3, 2.6, 2.7. And as you know, um, because of the advanced material in this course, um, here, why don't you turn the 
Okay. Oh, yeah, it's good actually to leave it where it was. Oh, all right. Um, maybe I should pose here so that somebody copy this down. Um, so this is the homework assignment. Grading. Uh, grading here is going to be um, uh, quite generous. Um, I would say, uh, well, I don't know, but it, it, in the past I've often said, um, if you do the homework and get it right, you get an A plus. You don't, if you do the homework and get it wrong, you get an A. And if you don't do the homework, you get an A minus. Now, I'm not sure I'll adhere to that exactly, but something like that. It's, um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you the lowest grade will be, let us say, a B, a gentleman's B. But um, I may even make it, um, I may even adhere to the scheme I just said. Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think you learn more if you're relaxed. So in this course, you should focus not on the grades, but uh, think of homework as um, something that you should, that if you do it, you'll learn something. And uh, that's one of the things that um, American universities have really gotten right, which is um, the utility of assigning homework and having students do problems. They're, I think in some countries they don't do that, and instead they just concentrate on concepts. And the trouble is you get the concepts, but it turns out, I mean, what is understanding a concept? It's that there's, you feel certain neurons in your brain go and you say, oh, I understand it. Well, they understood something when they went but when you do the homework, you see you not only need to do pss, but you also need pss and pss and so forth. And um, that means that you wind up seeing things from different angles. And um, that's uh, good. Let me maybe, uh, since we do have six minutes left, let me just say something uh, about What, 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 what's actually going on here in this interaction of life with atoms. Um, the, the basic idea, of course, is that your Hamiltonian is basically, uh, I'll use certain units here, E over C A squared over 2M so this is the atomic Hamiltonian, and why do we have this funny P minus E over C A? Well, it's that um, this is the uh, conjugate momentum, the derivative of Lagrangian with respect to, to V, V, the velocity of the uh, of the um, electron, say. And so there's a term, the most important term then is P dot A. A is the electromagnetic field, and this electromagnetic field, A of X, is going to be some integral, and we're going to be integrating over, well, we could say, let's see, since we use P, let me integrate over P. There are conventional factors. In this book, the conventional factors are 2 pi q twice the energy, or equivalently h bar omega. And then here we have A of P. And actually, there are two polarizations. So we have um, S, say, for the polarization. E to the i P x. This is the Lorentz inner product. And then we have a dagger of P and S, e to the minus I, PX. Now, um, when I say we're renting a product here, I haven't told you what the metric is. And because I don't remember what the metric is, if it's a plus sign here, 
But um, anyway, it's uh, it's one or the other. Um, it's either well, I, Schwartz uses the metric p x is p zero x zero minus p dot x. I'm used to the other one, but I've I don't know. These these are metrics are half the time it's this, half the time it's minus that. Um, uh, so this is the, the electromagnetic field, and the interaction Hamiltonian then is P dot A times what? Times minus E over C, E over MC, say, P dot A. That's the interaction Hamiltonian. And so you see that that interaction Hamiltonian will have these various terms, an A, plus an A dagger with um, these phase factors. Those are raising and lowering. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly the same. In fact, the, the relation is A of P and S, A dagger of P prime and S prime is delta Q of P minus P prime delta S, S prime. So this is, this is the polarization, whether it's forward or backward or right or left. And then this, in continual normalization, is a delta function of momentum. In, um, if we're thinking instead of A of N and S, A dagger of N prime and S prime, then the commutator is um, delta N1, N2, chronica delta, N1, N1 prime, Delta N two and two prime delta N three and three prime delta S S prime. So it's a product of chronic deltas one or zero, and this is the delta functional. And um, so it's and, and one of the things that is quite amusing in 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 this quantum mechanics is you see this x that sits here is actually the x operator that's conjugate to p. Um, and this thing here is actually the kinetic momentum. And this is the conjugate momentum. So what you have is xi pj is i h bar pj. And um, uh, so, um, so th what I have that last few minutes, they're not in Schwartz's book, at least not in chapter one. Um, probably something similar to one of the All right, so I'm going to start chapter two next time. And um, it's really important to ask questions because sometimes I forget, sometimes I skip things. Sometimes I make mistakes. Um, so for all these reasons, questions. And of course, if you're really hungry, just ask your question even if you know the answer. It's all right, just do that. Yeah. I thought you meant like hungry for knowledge. I thought you meant like hungry for knowledge, and I meant you guys. Well, just hungry. Either way. All right.